So as I said, I had a blank Excel seat here. I have a bunch of data in sheet two here. Um, I will share the link to this. As I said, the link to this was in the chat. Um, and I've simply typed a series of numbers here, just numbers off the top of my head, don't even care what they are. And there are some formulas that you can do in Excel, which always begin with an equal sign. And you can do simple math. I can say 45 plus three times two minus one. And if I hit enter, it gives me an answer. Now, if you can remember back to your math courses or the courses you're currently taking, I need you to remember the order of precedence. In math, when you say the order of precedence, you're talking about uh, the order in which calculations are made. The way I remember this, and maybe you've been taught it this way too, is please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. First you do parentheses. So the P stands for parentheses. If anything in your formula or function is in parentheses, that is done first. Inner parentheses are done before outer parentheses. Exponents, any number raised to an exponent. The way you do an exponent is in Excel is with the caret. So if I were to do three caret five, that represents three to the fifth power. So that's an exponent, if you had one of those in your calculation. After that, it does multiplication, then it does division, then it does addition, and then it does subtraction. So that's the order of precedence. I'm gonna assume that everybody's comfortable with that. If you're not, unmute yourself and holler with a question. It's just the way math is done. And to show you how this might change, if I edit this, and put the two minus one in parentheses, it means it's gonna do that subtraction first. So now when I hit enter, the answer is 48 instead of 50 because it's doing the subtraction before it did the multiplication three times two because we do parentheses first, then exponents, then multiplication and division, then addition and subtraction. So as long as you understand that order of precedence, we're good. You don't have to worry about it any further than that, okay? All right. Um, let me double check something. Yes, okay, good, thank you. So that's just a very quick thing to just to talk about how Excel will do your mathematical calculations based on the order of precedence. And when I'm in here, I can make this calculation do anything I want as long as I begin it with an equal sign. Now, instead of 45, I can put a cell address. Instead of the three, I can put another cell address. Uh, times two, uh, I could put another cell address and then I could say minus and put another cell address. So you can mix and match. You can do hard numbers or you can do cell addresses. Almost always within your formulas, you're going to do cell addresses over numbers, although occasionally you will hard code a number. If you find yourself hard coding a number such as this two, make sure that you ask yourself, does this number really need to be hard coded or should I be referencing a cell? Okay. Um, can everybody see the screen okay or should I try to like enlarge it a little bit? Let me see if I can make it a little bit bigger just for a little while just to make it easier to read what's going on. Maybe that's a little better, okay? And you can see too, when you reference cell addresses, you get little boxes around the cell addresses in your data to let you know that those are included in your formula. It's just a little way of marking and color coding what's being used within the system. And then you get your answer in the cell that contains your formula, okay? Now, 
You can do any mathematical calculation that you want using only cell addresses or cell addresses and hard-coded numbers. If you use cell addresses and you're doing math, make sure the value in those cell addresses are actually numbers because you can't multiply something by say the name Fred, you have to multiply it by a number. Also keep in mind that some numbers in Excel are worthless when it comes to math. You, do, you wouldn't take a list of zip codes, add them together, divide them by the number of zip codes to get the average zip code. That, that's a worthless value because zip code, while it contains numbers, is not a mathematical number, it's just a numeric label and you wouldn't necessarily do math with it. Same with a phone number, social security number, ID numbers, just there's lots of numbers out there that you would never do math with, okay? So um, another way to look at this rather than just building these formulas by ourselves, is we can do what are called functions within Excel. And a function begins with an equal sign and then you simply have to tape in the name of the function and it immediately gives you a little bit of help to say, oh, did you mean sum, sum if, sum if s, sum product, sum sq, sum x2, my2, lots of different choices. Sum is what I want, so then I'll do an open parent. And now it's asking me, what do you want to sum together? Well, I want to sum all those numbers from A4 to A9. Now I could put in values here, but what I really want to do is say A4, put in the colon and say A9, and then close my parentheses. This simply says, add all the numbers together from A4 to A9 and give me the answer. And when I hit enter, I get a sum. Okay, we did a sum last week. I also showed you last week that if you highlight all the numbers plus an extra cell and go up here to the top right and hit the auto sum button, that it will sum it for you. And it produces the exact same function of that sum parentheses A4 through A9. So it, it's just a little shortcut that's available for you up there in that menu. Now what I can also do is change the word sum to average. And now I'm saying average the numbers between A4 and A9. So I hit enter and there's my average. I could also say equal sign count A4 through a9 and it will count any cell that's not blank which gives me a total of six but if i blank one out it becomes a five because it only counts it if it contains something if it's blank it's not counted so that's this formula here the count function is an easy way to count up a column and see how many blanks or non-blanks that you have and it just counts it for you so there are all kinds of functions that we can put here. And the best way to find all the functions is when you're in the cell, up here at the top, you'll see this little F of X button. And if you click the F of X button, you will go to this little helper screen and it says, what would you like to see? You can say, uh, most recently used all functions, financial functions, date and time, math, statistical, lookup, text. We're going to do all kinds of these today, but just be aware that there are thousands, thousands of functions available to you, and there is no way I'm going to explain all of them to you today. If I say list all functions, these are all the available functions, and I can scroll down and highlight any one of these. And as I highlight them, it gives you a description and how you use it and what you might use for what particular calculation. So rather than focusing on all of these functions in here, I don't, I don't want you to just say, geez, that's way too many functions. I'm just going to start talking about some particular functions. Now, we talked about the sum and the average. We talked about the count. But there's all kinds of different functions. For example, there is a function called PMT. And the PMT function will let you calculate a payment on a loan amount. So what I'm going to do is over here, let's say in E4, I'm going to put the word loan. Which I can type. And then over here, I'm going to put um,
interest and I'm going to do a 0.02% interest, a 0.03.5% interest. I'm sorry, 0.35, I don't need that. No, it's not a date. So I'm going to highlight this cell, right click, choose format cells, and just format it to general and click OK. And now it's not a date anymore. And then I'm going to do one more interest rate over here of 04. Now in my loans, I'm going to borrow 100,000, 200,000, 300,000, and 400,000. So what I want to arrive here is at 2% interest, what is my payment on a $100,000 loan? In my case, I want to get a monthly payment on a $100,000 loan. So I'm going to buy a house or whatever I'm going to buy. I'm looking for an interest rate. But the last piece of interest, the last piece of information we need to calculate a payment is the term. So I'm going to borrow this money for 10 years. Okay? 10 years. And then we have three yearly interest rates, 2%, three and a half, and four. And then I have four different loans, 100,000, 200,000, three, and 400,000. So in this box right here, I want to know what is the payment on a $100,000 loan for 10 years at 2% interest? What is that monthly payment? So how do I figure that, figure that out? Well, Excel has a formula that will let you do it. And as we mentioned, all formulas in Excel begin with an equal sign, and then the name of the function, which in this case is PMT. And as soon as I type it in, I see that it shows up. I open my parenthesis because after the function name, it's always an open parenthesis. So what it's asking me for first, as you can see in that little yellow box, it might be a little small to see, but the first word highlighted is the rate. So the rate is my interest rate, but because I want a monthly payment and my interest rate is in years, I need to divide that interest rate by 12 to get roughly a monthly interest rate. Now I could just put 0.02 in here and divide it by 12, but it would be better if I did the cell address of F4. So the interest rate, the rate for my loan is in cell F4. And it's a yearly interest rate, so I'm going to divide it by two, which is just the forward slash and number two. That's a perfectly, I'm sorry, not two, 12. That's a perfect example of when you might use a hard-coded number because the year always has 12 months in it. Okay, so my interest rate is 2% yearly divided by 12 to get a monthly. If I then do a parenthesis, the next thing I need is n per, or the number of payments. Well, my term is 10 years, but if I'm doing a monthly payment, I'm doing 12 payments a year. So I have to take the 10 years times 12 months. Now I could do 10 times 12, but again, that would be erroneous because my term is in G1. So I'm gonna say G1 times 12. That's the number of payments I'm going to make. 10 years times 12 is 120 payments. And then I'm going to do a comma, and it says, what is the present value I'm borrowing? Well, the present value I'm borrowing is the loan amount, and that's in E5. So I've got my interest rate, which is F4 divided by 12 to take the yearly interest and convert it to a monthly. Take my term, G1, which is 10 years, but because I want a monthly payment, I have to convert the years to months. So I multiply G1, which is the term, times 12, times the 12 months. Then I do another comma and I, and I put how much money am I borrowing? In this first example, I'm borrowing $100,000 and that's in E5. I then close my parentheses. Now you can see that the interest rate, the term and the principal all those values are separated by commas. So each time I hit a comma, I was telling the function that I'm moving on to the next operator within this function.
So now that I've got the interest rate, the number of payments, and the money I'm borrowing, I can hit enter. And it will cost me $920.13 a month to borrow $100,000 at 2% interest for 10 years. So this little formula, this little function, excuse me, PMT, did that calculation for you. Okay? How are we doing? Anybody have any questions? Want to chime in and ask anything? Okay. All righty, good. So that's the payment function. Now, those of you that were here last week, and I think several of you were, because I recognize a couple of these names, we talked about something called absolute versus relative cell copies. That means that when you copy something in Excel, particularly a formula or a function, the cell addresses within that formula or function might change relative to where you copy it to or from. So let me ask you this. Um, let me open the uh, participants window. And if any of you have, uh, if any, if you need a refresher on relative versus absolute, just, just raise your hand in the chat. Okay. The way you do that is, I'm not in the chat, I'm sorry, in participants. Click the participants button at the top so the participants window is there. And then you have options at the bottom, one of which I believe is raise hand. Um, so if, if you don't, if you need me to re-review relative versus absolute in terms of its definition, I can do that. Okay, Waco, so Waco, sorry. Um, all right, so let's um, look at it again. I'm going to set up a little grid here of just some, some fake formulas. So I have a formula here called E4 plus G21. I'm going to change that G to a Q. These references, the E4, the Q21, have nothing to do with the row you're in, have nothing to do with the column you're in. If I want to copy this formula, E4 plus Q21, to the next cell over, when I copy it, that formula is going to change. In other words, if I copy this formula, E4 plus Q21, what's the problem? Oh, E4 has a label in it. All right, let's use E14. <laughs> and the answer is zero because there's no numbers in each of those. But again, it says E4, E14 plus Q21. I'm going to copy this and paste it one to the right. And now let's look at what it says here. It says F14 plus R21, whereas this one says E14 plus Q21. Why did it change? Well, this is what we call the relative versus the absolute copy, okay? E14, when I copied one to the right, the E became an F. So E14, one to the right of E is F, so that becomes F14. Plus doesn't change because it's just a plus. And then when I copied the Q21, the Q became an R because one to the right, as I move for my copy, one to the right of Q is R. Now the number 21 and 14, they didn't change because I didn't copy it up or down. Okay, so now I'm gonna delete this one. I'm going to put the equal sign back at the beginning. So my formula again is E14 plus Q21. And now I'm going to copy this one, but I'm going to go down three and over three and paste. And I get zero again, but now I've got G16 plus S23. And what I copied was E14 plus Q21. So 
why did the G, why did the E become a G? Because this was E, F, G. Two over from E is G. Why did the 14 become a 16? Because two down, 14, 15, 16, the 14 becomes a 16 because I copied it two down. Why did the Q become an S? Well, three over from Q is S and I copied three over. And the 21 became a 23 because from 21 to 23, I went down two more rows. So that's what a relative copy means and how a relative copy works. Was that refresher helpful? Did that get people uh, kind of back on track with what the, what the relative copy is? Now, if I didn't want something to change, I could go into my formula here. And if I put a dollar sign in front of the E, it says, no matter what I do, don't change the E. If I put a dollar sign in front of the 21, it says, no matter what I do, don't change row 21. So I'm going to take this formula now and copy it. Get rid of the equal sign so you all can see what, it, what the new one looks like versus the old one. And you can see that the E, even though I moved over from G to H, I moved over two more columns, the E didn't change because the dollar sign said, hey, if you copy this, don't change the E. That's what the dollar sign means. 16 did not have a dollar sign, so 14, two down, became 16. S, the Q changed to S because there was no dollar sign, and Q, R, S, to the right, two to the right of Q is S. Now the 21 didn't change because it had a dollar sign, and even though I went down two rows, it still hard-coded the 21, okay? That is relative copy versus absolute copy, and the dollar sign is what you use to make it absolute, meaning don't change that reference at all. Why am I telling you all this? Well, because what I wanna do now is go up here to this formula, this payment formula, and I wanna copy this formula so that not only can I see my payment for a 10 year term on $100,000 at 2%, I wanna see my payment on it for a 10 year term on $100,000 for 3.5% and 4%. So what I wanna do is I wanna copy this payment function from the first column to the second and third column. My question to you is, what values in this formula need to be relative, meaning leave them the way they are, and what values need to be absolute, meaning put a dollar sign in front of them so that no matter where I copy them, nothing changes. Because if I copy this right now and put it over here, I get a really weird function because when I look at it, I'm looking at G4. G4 is the interest rate, which is fine. H1, oh, that's my term. Well, G1 is the only thing with term in it, and H1 doesn't have a term, so that's wrong. And then I have an F5, which is my loan amount, but F5 is my last payment amount, so that didn't work in my favor either. Does that make sense? So what I want to do is rewrite this whole payment function so that if I copy it, nothing changes, or I'm sorry, things change appropriately. <laughs> Not nothing changes, things change appropriately. So I'm gonna edit my function, and my first value is F4, which is my interest rate. And when I look at my interest rate, I ask myself, F, the interest rate right now is in column F. Does the interest rate ever change from F to another column? And the answer is yes because the interest rate will change to G and then it will change to H as I copy this function to the left. So that tells me because I have multiple interest rates that I want the F to change to a G and then change to an H as I copy it. So F is relative, I'm gonna leave it alone. Now the four, the four is the row the interest rate is in. The interest rate is only in one row, it's only in row four, so that is my indication that no, do not change row four. 
when we copy this, the interest rate is always row four, okay? It's always divided by 12 because it's 12 months. Well, yeah, 12 months in a year. And then my, my net payment or my number of payments is G1. Now G1 is the only cell that has my payment in. And if it's the only cell that has my payment, it must be an absolute cell, which means when I copy this, don't change the G, don't change the one. And then we're still gonna multiply it by 12. And then the last one is what I'm, loan, what I'm borrowing, the amount of my loan. Well, the loans are always in E. They might change rows and they do five, six, seven, eight, nine, but E, the loan amount is always in column E. So I know that that should be a dollar sign. So when we look at this function, we're saying payment function, F4 for the interest, you can change the F, but don't change the four because we have interest in G and H divided by 12. Then we take our term, which is only in G1. So the G is absolute and the one is absolute. And we multiply that by 12. So whenever I copy this, the term will always be G1. And then my loan amount will always be in column E, but from row five, six, seven, eight, those row numbers need to change so I can get my other loan amount. So when I hit enter, I get the same answer, but now when I copy it from here to two col the two columns over, these payments remain correct to the payment function because I said, change the F to a G, which it did, but keep the four the same. G1 is absolute, G1, G1, G1. The E never changes, but the five might become a six, except in this example, we want G4, which is my interest rate above. We want the term, which is the absolute G1 at the top. And we want the loan, which is the absolute E relative row five for the $100,000. So by doing that, each of these three functions are now correct. What I can do now is highlight this row, copy it down to my other values, and I get a correct calculation for each of my scenarios because my relative and absolute cell referencing with and without the dollar sign made sure that my calculation is always correct based on my table. Any questions? Can unmute and ask or raise your hand. Either way, it doesn't matter to me or if we're good, we're good. Okay, so I do this to show people the payment function. But I also do this to, so that, to really drive home this idea of why relative versus absolute cell referencing can be so useful, okay? If you can get your brain around the absolute versus relative cell references with the dollar sign or no dollar sign, you're 90% of your way to understanding a lot about Excel. Okay, so this is the payment function. What I wanna do now, is switch over to some, some more, comp, not complicated, more interesting, how's that? More interesting functions, included, including some functions that involve data. So if you downloaded and opened the Excel sheet that we're working with, and you don't have to, you can just watch, whatever you wanna do is fine. I'm gonna go to sheet two by clicking the tab at the bottom, sheet two, and we're gonna see some data don't you don't have to care about what this data is it's just some funky data i grabbed to mess around with there's no student identifying information in here you're not going to figure out what it is and who's who because it just isn't anything of value to anyone it's fake data i'm just going to adjust my row columns real quick okay so i have an id i have a term I have a R&D, which I'll say stands for round. 
have RES for residency. They're either US or international, let's say that. Uh, there's an AP rate. I have no idea what AP is, but there's an AP rate, okay? And then there's a gen field. So they're either yes or no in the gen field. And then they have a total count of something. Don't care what that total count is. I just know there's a total count of something. And I have a number of credits ranging from zero to 18 or something. And most people have zero. That's fine. We don't key care. And then there's a tag for a full-time or a part-time. Some people have them and some people don't. It really doesn't matter. But what I want to do is um, show you some more functions that can be more useful when you have rows of data. So instead of just averaging and summing and doing a payment, I want to do some other types of functions as well. And remember, there are thousands of functions in Excel, predefined functions, and I'm only going to show you a few of them today because we don't have time to do all thousands of them. So the next function that I like to talk about is the if function. OK? So we have a total count. And I'm going to do an if function that says, if total count equals two, say, put the word yay. Otherwise, put the word boo. OK? Now, why am I doing that? I don't know. I just want to show you how the if function works. But because it's a function, we know it begins with an equal sign. Now, I called it the if function. Hang on, let me uh, enlarge my screen again here for you guys. I think it's just easier for y'all to see when things are bigger. <laughs> so much for my column width. Remember, if you double click between your column headers, it makes the column just wide enough to hold your largest piece of data. You hover till you get that double-headed black arrow. You double-click. You can also highlight a whole bunch of columns and set their width all at once. Okay. All right, so that's hopefully a little bit visual. So I'm going to do a function called if. Function begins with equal. I put in the word if, and then I open my paren because that is how all functions work. And then I'm going to say if G2, because G2 is where my count field is, if G2 equals 2, then, and I'm going to specify the then with a comma, if it's true, then quote, yay, end quote, comma, or otherwise, boo, end quote. And then I'm going to close my parentheses. This function says, if cell G2 equals 2, display the word yay. Otherwise, display the word boo. Now, in G2, in this example, the count is 0. So because it doesn't equal 2, we're not going to get yay. We're going to get boo. And if I hit Enter, that's what I get. Now, if I change this to a 2, it becomes a yay. Now, what this says in this if function is, if G2 equals 2, OK, well, what happens if G2 equals 6? Well, it's still a boo, because it says if G2 equals 2. Now, if we say if G2 is greater than 2, now I get the yay. But now if it's 2, I get the boo because two is not greater than two. Two equals two. If I wanted it to be greater than or equal to two, I could just do greater than or equal to two. And now two will equal yay. Are we OK? So now what I'm going to do is copy this function and paste it. Oh, I'll just go down a few rows. I don't have to do it all and paste. And now you can see that this formula says if G2 is greater than or equal to 2, then yay, otherwise boo. And this next one, if I hit F2, it says if G3. So the G2 became a G3, which is good because that's what we wanted it to do. 
And then if I go down again, the G3 will become a four and a five and a six and so on because that's the relative copy, okay? And if any of these numbers change, the yay and the boo update accordingly based on the if function that we produced. Sorry, I hit the wrong function key. Based on the if function that we produced that says if G17 is greater than or equal to one, it's not, I mean two, it's not, it's one, then we should get boo and indeed we do, okay? Now, this is the simplest form of the if, and you might say, well, who cares if it's yay or boo? Well, maybe you're doing a, an inventory, and maybe this total count is the number of widgets on hand. And you want to know if you get less than five widgets on hand, because if you get less than five widgets on hand, you might want to reorder. So if E2, is less than five, <laughs> we want to reorder. Otherwise, in stock. Okay, so if I copy this down, they're all reorder because all of them are less than five. But if I do a six, a seven, an eight, a five. You can see that based on my count, it's either in stock or I need to reorder. And that's just a really quick, easy visual way to see something based on an if function. Now we can go a little bit further. We can also nest an if inside of an if, and we can also do a calculation inside of an if. So if I said F2, and say if G2 is less than five, then G2 times E2. So now I'm saying else just G2. So now what I'm saying is if G2 is less than five, take G2 and multiply it by E2 and put the answer in the cell. Otherwise, just give me G2. So if G2 is less than five, it's not, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, if G2 is less than five, it's not. But if I make it less than five, I get the calculation of four times five, G2 times E2, which is 20. So you can see that you, you it's not only that you can just do hard-coded values, you can also do other formulas and functions inside of the function. Is that okay? Also know that what I can also do is I can say if G5 is less than, if G2 is less than five, then multiply it by that, but then I can also do what's called a nested if and say else if and I can put an if inside of an if, as long as I put all of the other conditions in there that I want. If you don't want to worry about nested if right now, don't. If you get the basics of the if statement, we're rolling pretty good right now. Okay, so at this point, any questions, comments, rude remarks? Cool. Okay, so that's the if function, which can be very, very useful. Now there's also some other functions that involve treating your spreadsheet like a database. In other words, maybe I want to say some AP rate where residence equals IN. Okay, so I said sum, which is a little bit of a clue. If I do an equal sign and I say D, the D stands for data, and I do a D sum, and then my parenthesis, 
what is my database? Well, my database is my entire table. In this example, it would be A1 through I4000 or whatever, however many rows I have. And then it says, what field do you want to sum? Well, I want to sum the AP rate. And then my criteria is if RES equals IN. So what I need to do is build my criteria. I'm going to copy the header RES and just put it over here anywhere at random. And then I'm over here, I'm going to put IN. So these little range that I just built is basically my criteria. Oh. And my criteria says RES residency equals IN, international. I set up that criteria. I could set up another criteria where I said total count. And then I could say greater than four. And I set up another criteria, greater than four. OK? Now over here. I could say sum i n reses. Oops. Sum i n reses. So that's just a label. So how do I sum residencies that are i n? I just want to sum up. I want to sum the uh, the AP rate. So I'm going to sum AP rate where res equals IN. So I'm going to do the equal sign, D sum, my parentheses. Now, if you're asking yourself, how in the world would I ever know D sum? Well, I just know D sum because I've done it forever. But if you do the F of X button that we saw earlier and change the types of functions to data functions, you will find D sum in the list with an explanation of how it works. So I'm going to do some. It's asking me for my database. So instead of typing my database, I'm going to click the first cell of my database, and I'm going to hold down my shift key, move over to I, and then I'm going to page down until I get to the bottom of my data. And there's a lot of rows. The other thing I can do is an end down, and it would take me there immediately. That's my data range. I've highlighted everything, including the headers, to be my data table that I am deriving this value from. This is my database. Now I'm going to hit a comma for my next element. And that's the field that I want to sum. Let me scroll back up here to the top. And it put in my range A1 through I4714. If I'd have known that was my range, I could have typed it in. It was no big deal. Then I put in my comma. What field do we want to sum? Well, we want to sum AP rate. But within my data, column A is 1, column B is 2, column C is 3. Not because A is 1, B is 1, B is 2, C is 3, but because the first column in my data range happens to be column A. So that's number one, which means my AP rate is column number five. So I want to sum field number five within my database, which is AP rate, and then comma. And now I need my criteria. Well, my criteria is where RES equals IN, which I've set up in R1 through R2. That's my range. Residency equals IN. And when I close my paran oops, and hit enter, that is the sum of everybody whose residency is IN. That is the sum of their AP rate. So quick review, D sum A1 through I4714. That's my entire database. Sum the fifth column in my data, one, two, three, four, five is AP rate where the criteria is res r1 equals in which is r2 r1 through r2 is my criteria any questions about that structure
if we wanted to copy this, we would likely want our data range to be absolute, meaning everything should have a dollar sign. Maybe not the criteria. Maybe we want the, uh, the R to change because when we copy one to the right, that's going to give us an S. Or maybe that's always our criteria, so we would put dollar signs on it. You decide what's relative and what's absolute. So that's D sum. Now, as you might guess, in addition to D sum, we can also do D average. Same exact structure, but now the average AP rate, where RES equals IN, is 4.803. So I just changed the sum to an average, and now I'm using that to pull information out of my database. Now, instead of doing residency equals IN, let's do a total count greater than four. So I just need to change my criteria to S1 through S2. Oops. Now I have new criteria, but I'm only doing it, I'm only averaging if the total count is greater than four. Doesn't equal four, has to be greater than four. If I change this four to a five, let's see if that sum or that average changes. A little bit because one number got added in that wasn't added in before because it didn't meet the criteria before, but now it does. Okay. How are we doing? Raise your hand, unmute and ask. Run screaming through the woods. What are we going to do? Okay. So there's, these are data functions that require criteria. Now, I can complicate that a little bit because I can also change, instead of just saying S1 through S2, I can say R1 through S2. And now my criteria says where the res equals IN and their total count is greater than four. So now both conditions have to be met and my answer changes one more time. Now my criteria here says where the residence equals IN and total count is greater than four. If instead I wanted to say residence equals IN or total count equals four, I would take this value and drop it one row and then go here in my criteria and change this to S3. Now I'm saying res equals IN or total count is greater than four. So in this example, only one of the two has to be true. In the other example, they both had to be true. How are we doing? Okay. So there's D sum, D count, D average, lots of lots of, of data functions that you can do. Okay. So let's think about other functions, other data functions that, that might be useful, or not even necessarily data functions. Um, there's lots of other, there's also a lot of uh, functions called string functions that allow you to manipulate strings or text or labels. So if I look at, let's say, um, an equal sign, because we know all functions begin with an equal sign, and now I'm going to do use the word left. I don't want everything I'm going to reference. I only want the left, left characters, so many left characters, maybe the first three characters um, of a cell. So I'm going to say left, and then I'm going to pick the cell uh, C4, and then I'm going to do a comma, and I'm going to say that of C4, I only want the first two letters. So left, starting at the left, in C4, give me two characters. I close my parand and I get FR because C4, the left two most characters are 
FR. So that's a text string. Now you might guess that if you change the word left to right, it'll give you two characters of C4 starting from the right end of the string, and we get EG because the rightmost, the right two most characters in C4 are EG. Is that okay? So you can do a left, you can do a right, and there's another one called midstring. I think it's called midstring. I get confused because I do lots of different coding, and some call it midstring, some call it substring. It just depends. They just call it mid. So I'm going to say mid. I'm going to pick my text, which again is C4. And now I need a starting position because I'm not going to start at the beginning. I'm not going to start at the end, left or right. I'm doing the middle of the string. So in the middle of the string, starting with number two, I want two characters. This should give me RE because FREG, C4, the second character is an R. And if I take two characters, I get RE. So the answer to this should be RE. And indeed it is because I'm doing a mid string, middle of that text. C4 is the text. Start with position two and include position two and take two characters. So that's a mid string. So we got left string, right string, mid string. You can do all kinds of data manipulation with this. Now, the other thing I can do is in addition to the, the mid string, the RE, I can do an ampersand and then say left parand, let's do um, C16. I'm just pulling things randomly, comma. And from the left, I'm going to grab two characters, so I should get a TR. So now I'm going to grab the mid string of C4, two for two, which is going to be RE and then concatenate it, that's what the ampersand means, link together, concatenate, not add together, just link together because it's text, that's what the ampersand is, left of C16 for two characters, which is TR. So what I should get here is RETR. And indeed, that's what I get because I combined a mid string and a left string and connected them with an ampersand. You can manipulate strings to do all kinds of goofy things for you. Um, one of the things that I do all the time with midstring and substring and things like that so if I put in my email address here oh and of course it turned it into a link and I don't want it to be a link uh, remove hyperlink okay make it a little bit bigger so this is hinsra at women.edu. So that's my email address. But if I just wanted my username, I could say equal sign, left parand, this cell, comma, six. And so from the email address, I've extracted my username using a string function. The problem with this method, however, is that not all usernames are six characters long. My last name only has four letters, and then it's your first and middle initial. And the way our email addresses and usernames work is it is up to the first six letters of your last name plus your first initial, middle initial. Some people don't have middle initials. Some people's last name are shorter than six characters, like mine. So this right now will only work for me. But if I said left K5, okay, and then the length of K5, the length of K5 just means it's going gonna, it's gonna to count how many characters there are. So the length of K5 in my example is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 characters. Now, of those 18 characters, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 of them are the at Whitman.edu. So if I subtract those 12, I've essentially made a formula that will always grab the username no matter how long the list is, 
as long as everybody's email address is a Whitman is an at Whitman.edu. So if I hit enter, I get my Hinsra. Now let's do let's do another um, Hamel to at Whitman.edu. Damn it. I hate it when it does that. I don't want to do that. Stop doing that. All right. Remove hyperlink. Boom. Make it a little bigger so you can see it. And now I'm going to copy this formula down to here. And now you can see that it doesn't matter how long the username is, my formula can figure it out because it takes the value and then it takes the length and subtracts the at Whitman.edu, which is 12 characters. And then it magically creates the correct reference for the next person. How are we doing with that? If I wanted to, I could just say equal sign L E N parand uh, K six. And it would tell me, oh, it's 20 characters long. It just tells you because that's what the L E N function does. It's just instead of putting in the 20 or whatever it might be, I just put that in as part of the formula just to make things easier. Questions, comments, we're doing okay. Raise your hand, unmute and say something, whatever you like to do. Okay. All right. So we got about 25 minutes left. And I haven't crashed once, which is an awesome thing. <laughs> um, let's see. I'm going to get rid of all this detritus because we don't really need it right now. Okay, now the other thing I want to show you, we've been doing all this data manipulation and things, is that Excel has some built-in data functions that you can just use on your database. So if I go to the beginning of my database, which is A1 through I4000, whatever it was, I could highlight my whole database if I wanted to, or if I don't have any empty rows, which I don't, if I start right here, Excel kind of knows what my database is. So if I go up here and hit the data option at the top, and then I hit this filter button, I get these little triangles next to each of my headers. And if I go down, let's say I pull down the full-time part-time header, and instead of saying select all, I select only the PTs. So now if I hit OK, it filters my entire data set and just shows me all the PTs. And in my database, out of 4,715 4, records, there's only two that are listed as part-time. Now I can go back to this, and you see the little triangle change to a little funnel, or maybe you can't see because it's tiny, but it did. If I click on that again and uncheck part-time, I can list the people who are full-time by checking just full-time. I click OK on that, and I have four that are full-time. Now, I can go back into that and say, I want the people who are part-time and full-time, but I don't want the blanks. So I'm just going to check part-time and full-time. I hit OK, and now we have all six of those because we're, we're keeping both of them within the same data set. Also, once I filtered on this column, I could then go down to total count here and say that under the total count, I don't want them all. I only want the ones that are zero and I can say, okay. And now these are the people that are just full-time or part-time, not blank, and their total count is zero and I get a subset of my data. If I'm all done filtering, the quickest way to turn off all the filters is to just hit this filter button at the top again, and it all comes back. 
when you're filtering, it doesn't remove any of your data. It just hides it temporarily. Are there any questions about the filtering? Okay. Now, like I said, Excel has thousands of little features and I can't show you every feature in the short hour and a half that we have, but I'm trying to show you things that will hopefully be useful to you or if those aren't specifically useful to you, you might think, well, they have an average, I wonder if they have a count. Well, they have a count, I wonder if they have a mean. I wonder if they have a cosine. If you hit that f of x button, I promise you, you'll find all of that in that function listing somewhere. There are thousands and thousands of predefined functions in Excel, okay? All right, um, any questions before I move on? We're doing okay? Um, I want to do one thing really quickly. Uh, didn't do what I wanted it to do. No, what I wanted. Let's try it once more with feeling. Okay, now I got it. Great. Okay, so. We're good. All right. Um, let's see. What have I not shown you how to do? I think it would be useful. Um, there's another uh, fun type of function that I'd like to show you, which is called a VLOOKUP. So to do the VLOOKUP, I'm going to erase all this stuff that I have up here. You don't have to erase yours if you don't want to. You can put what I'm going to do somewhere else. It doesn't really matter. I want to do a VLOOKUP. I'm going to, meaning if I put in a value, so if I say ID and then next to ID, I put 232353. Three. So that's my ID right here, 232353. Three. I want to take that ID and with that ID, look up their term and also look up their AP rate, okay? So here's my ID. So I want the term for this ID to show right here, which should be 21 FA. And the AP rate for this person should be three. So in this cell, I'm gonna do a function called a VLOOKUP that's going to let me find the term for the ID that I placed in cell M2. So I'm going to begin with an equal sign because all functions begin with an equal sign. And then I'm going to say VLOOKUP, except I have to spell it right. And then I'm going to do a paran. And it asks me for the lookup value. Well, my lookup value is in M2. That's the number I want to look up. Table array, that's my database. What, what is everything in my database? Well, I'm gonna say it's A1 through I, I don't know, 4200. I, I don't know how much of that is actually my data, but this should be, would be my normal full data range. A1 through I, however many rows I have. Then I'm gonna do a comma and I'm gonna say column index. What number column do you want to bring back? Do I wanna bring back column number one, which is the ID, or column number two, which is the term, or column number three, so on and so on. Well, I want the term, and in my data range, the first column is the ID, so column one is ID, column two is term, column three is R&D, column four is res, and so on, because I said term, I want column two for the term. And then I close my parenthesis and I hit enter. Oops. I'm gonna say false because I want an exact match. Now let me explain what this is. If I look for the number 232353 as my M2 value to look up, if I find 
and I, do I want it to find an exact match or the closest one? I want it to find an exact match. So I'm going to put the word false saying exact match as part of my formula. Why is it still not working? M2, A1 through, all right, let me try. Give me just a second. There we go. Okay, I must add a stray character in there or something. So it looked up my term, but if I change this number to somebody else, it looks up their term. So what this lookup, what this lookup does is, after I've set up these formulas, I can change that ID up there, and these reference cells will change for the person that I selected in cell M2. So what I want to do now is do the same thing, except now I want to get the AP rate instead of the term. Now what's interesting is I can copy this formula to do that, but I need to set my relative versus absolute. Now, the only place that my ID lookup is is M2, so that's got to be double absolute. Also, my data range is only this, so that's got to be absolute as well. Oops. Adding a thousand here, folks. Sorry. Okay, so now when I copy this, because everything is absolute, I'm going to get exactly the same thing. But if I now edit this, and instead of grabbing column two, I want AP rate, which is column five. So the formula is exactly the same. I just said, instead of bringing back column two, bring back column five. When I hit enter, I get the AP rate. And if I change this value to another student, then all of those numbers update for that student. So imagine you had an auto parts list of 3,000 parts. And you didn't want to scroll through all of it to find out the part. You just simply build these VLOOKUP functions to look the numbers, to look the values up for you. So now this table over here becomes a database. And this reference number up here, when you put it in this cell, allows you to pull these derivative values from your database itself, not derivative values, values within your database. And again, that's done with the VLOOKUP. The false simply means find an exact match to my number. If you set it to true, it's going to find the closest match or an approximate match. But when you do that, the values in the first column, your data has to be sorted by that lookup value because it's actually looking for that, the closest to that value I think, or less. So if you're not sorted ascending in numerical order or alphabetical order, as soon as it finds a number that any other number is bigger than, it just says, oh, nope, didn't find it. So if you do a true, you have to make sure that your data is sorted by your lookup column in order to get the closest or the approximate match instead of an exact match. I want to do false. So we're going to make it the exact match, except it's still said to true for some reason, and I don't know why. Well, it's because it doesn't matter. I want an exact match. There we go. Questions? Comments? Data overload? We're doing OK. So we're at about 5.15. At this point, I'll just be randomly pulling things to show you. Um, I guess my question would be, is there anything Excel, in Excel that you've seen done that you'd like me to show you that I can show you in the next 15 minutes with one caveat that it is possible for somebody to ask me how to do something in Excel and my answer is going to be, I don't know. But is there anything you'd like me to show? We can either take questions or we can just say, you know what, that's, that's enough data for today and we don't need to do any more. Does anybody have anything they'd like to ask about or like me to show them how to do 
or anything in particular that I didn't show you in Excel that you wished I would have? You can either raise your hand or unmute and ask, whatever you want to do. Okay, well, then we will call that today's session. I'd like to remind you that next week is our next session where we will be looking at pivot tables. I've asked a coworker of mine, Eric Hamilton, who is a Whitman alum, to come next week and teach that for you because he's much better at, at pivot tables than what I do. So I'm gonna ask him to look at you for that, uh, to teach you that. I'll be here to kind of see what's going on. Um, if you have other questions, please feel free to mail me. I'll, I'll help you whenever I can. Uh, my email address is H-I-N-Z, H-I-N-Z-R-A at Whitman.edu. And you can ask me questions and I'll, I'll do my best to get back to you. I can't guarantee a one day response, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll do the best I can. Okay. And given that, I am going to call the end of our workshop today. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I want to thank you all for showing up and coming. Hope to see you next week. And we will go ahead and close out the workshop.